So Bruce, you've been known to leap around stages, vault over ramps and scamper along narrow ledges on Iron Maiden sets and that's before the gigs even bloody started mate, isn't it? But um, <laughs> you told me a while ago that actually you did yourself some serious damage because apparently, if I remember rightly, you toppled off, was it an elevated part of the stage, uh, onto the drum kit during the actual concert itself, didn't you? Oh yeah, no, 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 um, absolutely. That, that was in a Universal Amphitheater. And the irony of it was, was that it was all in the era of, of mobile phones and nobody saw it. <laughs> I was wow. like, surely, surely somebody must have footage of me, you know, making an ass of myself. But, but no, I went off the, we had a, 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 a we had a birthday party for Yannick, um, which meant that, uh, we got like whipped cream and like splattered in with paper plates and whipped cream. And somebody had left a couple of plates of it on the top of this big riser that goes at the back of the stage um, over the top of the drum kit. And um, at the time it was just black painted wood. And because it was black painted, this cream had soaked into the wood and basically the grease, it was just like uh, ice. Yeah. And I went running towards the edge of the stage, thinking I was going to stop. And um, like, you know, Princess Anne's horse, you know, I refused, but the horse accepted. Hello. And uh, yeah. and I went up headfirst into the drum kit, um, uh, made and, uh, and and but bounced off it and did a sort of a weird forward roll and ended up upright, still singing, clinging onto the mic. But I, I ripped all the muscles in my shoulder and back and everything. Yeah which um, adrenaline got me through the show. And then the next day we had another show and I was really hurt. Then we went to yeah. uh, um, Japan and uh, suddenly after the first show there, I was walking with a stick. Well, I was going to ask there, Bruce. So, so the question, you kind of preempted it. So the question I was going to ask is, so did, did you feel, I mean, you felt a bit of pain at the time, but did the pain kick in right there? And then was it, was it kind of later after the gig had ended that you felt most? No, I, 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 I knew. I knew I'd really hurt myself um, because there's a different kind of pain. Yeah. This was like a really deep, deep pain. I was just like, I can yeah. ignore this for a certain amount of time, uh, probably the next few songs. Yeah. But this is really going to hurt. Yeah. And this is not going to, I don't, I, I was thinking, this is not going to go away, is it? Yeah. I think this is, I've really hurt myself. Well, there. that kind of really um, gels and, and, and kind of accords with the science because... Apparently, when we hurt ourselves, we don't actually generate pain in the part of the body that we've actually injured. Pain is generated in our, in our brains, which means, of course, that our experience of pain isn't just to do with muscle and tissue damage, but it's actually a product of the context in which we find ourselves in as well. So in your case, you're on stage in front of 50,000 screaming Iron Maiden fans and your brain's tapped you on the shoulder and says, listen here, Bruce, we've got a bit of a problem because we've done ourselves a bit of a mischief here, but the show's got to go on, right? So I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll get through the next few songs and then we'll deal with the pain after that. So that's why you managed to get through the first you know, few songs after that, but then it kind of kicked in later. Um, yeah. And so you know, it's, do you know how people discovered this, Bruce? Do you know how people actually worked out the pains in the brain and not actually in the part of the part of the body that you injure? It was a load of doctors who'd been working with amputee patients. And these patients, some of them had started reporting feeling pain in the limb that had actually been amputated. So obviously the doctors, Phantom limb. Yeah, phantom limb. Phantom syndrome. limb syndrome. That's right. Yeah. So the doctors yeah. realised that well, actually, the pain can't be located in the actual limb because it's not there anymore. So it must be located in the brain. So the science of pain is way more complex than you might think. And we've got a guy who's waiting to join us on Psycho Schizo Espresso today, who is... No, he's not Doctor Who. He's not Doctor He's not Doctor Who. He's not. No. No. He's not Doctor Who. He is a professor of pain. One of the world's few professors of pain. His name's Chris Eccleston. He is the director of the Centre for Pain Research at the University of Bath. And he's waiting to talk to us about all kinds of things from body modification to torture to, well, how to deal with that toothache. What to do if you think you're getting a headache. Exactly. All kinds of things across the pain spectrum. He's a fascinating guy. Should we get him on? I think we should. Chris, welcome to Psycho Schizo Espresso. I 
have to say, Chris, that unofficially, behind the scenes, mate, you are known to me and Bruce as Professor Payne. We've been calling you Professor Payne behind the scenes. And um, mm. it's, I mean, it's, it's strange, really, because I was doing a bit of research on this. And I mean, in, in one sense, there's no laughing matter. I think it's roughly about one in five of us in Europe anyway, find ourselves in a position of chronic pain. So pain research is obviously really, really important. But when I went on Google and I started looking for other professors of pain, they're few and far between. I mean, uh, do you, I mean, is the pain community, the pain research community, like a, a big one out there? Is it is it is it well recognised, or what's the situation? Because it's obviously really important. This. Yeah, it is important. Thanks, Kevin. Well, I've been called a lot worse, so I'll take that. That's fine, Professor Payne. Um, yeah, good point. Well, there's an international association for the study of pain, which has about seven thousand people in it. So there's quite a lot of people around the world. It's not as many as you would think. Uh, really invested in it. But you're right, in the UK alone, there are probably only, let me see, six professors of pain. So um, where I am at the University of Bath, we have two of them. So we're quite lucky in that. We're trying to grow our own. But you're right. I mean, let's look at the sort of incidence of chronic pain alone in Europe. So let's take Europe with 740 million people. You got 20% of people have pain. That's 140 million people or the population of France and Germany combined. Wow. saying that they have pain. That's a lot of people with needs, right? Yeah. The problem, of course, with that is that if it gets so common, then it just becomes part of daily life, something you expect, it's okay. And that's one of the challenges that we have, which is what's something clinical that really we can help with and what is, hey, you do, we're all just getting older and it's something we're just going to have to adjust to and get used to and be part of life and redefine. And that's part of the challenge uh, that we have. I still think there's quite a lot of pain that we can help with and we could talk about that today. There's a lot that we can do. And one of the reasons people aren't in this field, one is that the pipeline for good pain uh, interventions is drying up. Now, I remember, uh, uh, Chris, I, was, I saw you speak at a conference once and I was very struck by something that you said and I hadn't thought about it until I'd heard it. And then once I heard it, it made perfect sense. And you said that, it's really interesting that, you know, although you're a psychologist um, and psychologists are supposed to be interested in things that, you know, happen inside our heads, between our ears, us human beings actually spend way too much time in our heads and, and not enough time in our bodies. And so, you know, sometimes when something, when we get a physical um, shock or something like that, all of a sudden we're really surprised that, that we have a body and it kind of complete, completely disrupts us. And I hadn't thought about that until you'd said it, but it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? That's absolutely right. I mean, what I say is if people are interested in, psychologists are interested in the body at all, they're interested in it as a taxi for the mind to move it from one conversation to another. And and there, it's almost that if you were to listen to psychology, you'd think that we were totally interested in thoughts and beliefs and emotions, but actually the limits of what you're capable of doing and the limits of those thoughts and beliefs and behavior are physically embodied. And there are only certain things that you can do. What I'm interested in is putting the body back into psychology, but also putting psychology back into medicine. I can speak from, you know, personal experience, you know, having had the, the cancer treatment and then, uh, you know, I bust my Achilles tendon uh, and then I had a hip replacement yeah. and things like that. Now, the, n none of those two latter events were um, uh, as as traumatic as going through radiotherapy and chemo and everything, you know, with, with a with a you know with a, with a possibly questionable outcome, you know. But it was all okay in the end, thank goodness. But when something is, it's paralyzing, you know. And and even if you you know even if you have the brain of a Nobel Prize winner, you wouldn't be able to cope with functioning on that level. You have to go right down to base level. I just have to swallow water today. It's gonna to take me two hours. That is all my body can cope with. I have to concentrate solely on just that most mundane of tasks. Yeah, and and it's not just pain. I mean, I, I've been writing about the, what I call the 10 neglected physical senses, which are you know, everything from balance, movement, pressure, breathing, uh, fatigue and pain and itch are really very important. So all yeah. these things that sit in the background until they become so powerful. Appetite's a good example. If you're if you're thirsty, well, you might be thirsty now. You want to drink or not? But when when you're give it give it twenty four hours, you'll be able to think about nothing else except that. And I actually think that's a 
beautiful evolved system that we have with each of these physical senses that are really there to protect us because it's saying, stop getting distracted by yourself and remember that if you don't, whatever it is, breathe, scratch, avoid some damage, um, upright yourself, then it's all over. Um, as you know, I work in a, in elite sport and, and, yeah. and it's really interesting that, you know, if every, you know, I've, I go to say a, a rugby club or a football club or whatever, um, you've got strength and conditioning coaches in there, you've got physios, you've got di performance directors, all that kind of thing. I've yet to go to a club which has a pain expert in there. Um, and this is really, really interesting because there was a classic case, and I, I might even have mentioned to you this in a previous conversation, 2015, I think it was, Daniel Sturridge was a player at Liverpool. Um, Jurgen Klopp was the manager back then, still is, of course. And um, Sturridge was getting injured a lot of the time, and it obviously cost the club a lot of money. Jurgen Klopp had come out in the press and had said something like, Daniel Sturridge needs to get used to the idea of playing through pain. There's pain and then there's real pain. And he needs to get used to the idea of just playing through pain. Is there a difference between pain and real pain? Or an alternative explanation might be, and I just wanted to run this by you, that actually, you know, Sturridge was feeling the pressure of performing. He'd missed quite a few games the previous season through injury. And the more pressure he felt, maybe the more his brain was actually magnifying the pain he was feeling. And so actually, what might have felt like normal pain to, to one player was actually feeling like real serious pain to him. And, and actually, that was part of the problem. Um, mm. I mean, does that, does that make any sense to you? It does make sense to me. Uh, one thing, flippantly, I might say, is a lifelong Evertonian. I'm quite interested in Liverpool players being in pain. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, other side, I think, well, <laughs> let's let's unpick that, Kevin. It's quite interesting, isn't it? So uh, who's to say what's real pain and what's not real mm. pain? It always fascinates me. Is that the, So there's a whole field in, in that we're interested in is around stigma and judgment and other people's judgments about your pain. And we know a number of things. We know that that we tend to underestimate other people's pain. Mothers underestimate the pain of their children. Mm. Nurses underestimate the pain their patients get. And all I simply mean is if I said, how much pain do you think Bruce is in? And Bruce says five, and I say, well, it's probably about three. You know, this, there's a common bias for us to diminish the pain of others. And that's a coping strategy that we have because we don't like seeing other people in distress. It's not something conscious. We have this evolved propensity mm. to underestimate the pain of others. So that's the first thing that Jürgen's probably doing. Secondly, I think that these are high-performance athletes working in extremely uh, specific contexts, as you know, and work, uh, who are doing a very particular job. And pain is all about context. And so what many people do in training, not necessarily based on the literature, but what I've observed, is to try and uh, to get people to identify what is a normal part of extreme uh, sport and what is... And what is what teaches you about your limits, because pain and bodily sensations are all about limits, and what is danger. Mm. Now, pain has evolved fairly dumb, as we discussed before, to say all pain is linked to danger. That That's a very evolved system. And we'll, we maybe talk about people who choose to be in pain later, but people who are... All pain triggers the, the belief or the automatic thinking that there must be danger in my environment. Mm. So those high-performance athletes, either by design or by instruction, have learned that not all pain means danger. So I think partly what he's saying in that environment is that that mechanism, perhaps, is something that he wanted to, to rethink, is to help people rethink. I, I think just instructing people... Uh, just telling people to rethink it is probably not a good intervention. It might actually mm. be a better way of helping people understand what you can ignore safely and what you shouldn't ignore. I mean, it seems to me a no-brainer that that actually, you know, top professional outfits in elite sports should have pain specialists like yourself working in, within those environments. I mean, I think you could bring a, you know, a, a great benefit to... To, to elite sport environments. I, I think you're right. I think people can help enormously. But you can tell me, uh, I, I haven't worked in that environment. My understanding is that there is a culture of 
as in many painful environments, is let's not pay attention to because as soon as you pay attention Correct. to it. That's you're right. Lost. A lot of players will, and that's 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 in any in any elite sport environment, from track and field to rugby to football or whatever. Players will actually, if they are in pain, they will deny it. They will they will say yeah. they're not in pain yeah. because it might mean the difference between missing an Olympic trial, missing an FA Cup final. And, and playing in it. And so, you know, a- absolutely players will, you know, any athlete That's right. will, 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 will play through pain. That's right. The stakes are quite high. But I think taking it away from those individual performances and saying how do we help people understand uh, what, how to read their own limits and what, what is dangerous and what isn't dangerous, which can be learned, I think is quite important. But there's an awful lot of fear. There's an awful lot of uh, the studies that have been done is that, is that there's a lot of self uh, secret self medication that goes on. Mm. There's a lot of uh, avoidance of discussing things, and there's a lot of judgment and stigma around sort of the bravado around it. So that's a sort of messy culture uh, that that anybody working in that environment would need to try and find their way to be helpful within. Yeah. When people think about pain, of course, they, they think about, and, and I guess it's like an assumption that we've been using here so far, that, you know, if you if you stub your toe, the pain's in your toe. Um, but actually, it's like one of these fundamental, I suppose, facts that pain researchers know is the fact that pain pain's kind of located in the brain, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So, and I, I came across this amazing study, which, which um, or this amazing case report, I'm sure you'll be familiar with it, Chris, um, but but Bruce, I came across this. This is incredible. And it was a few years ago, and it was a bloke working on a building site. And you know what I'm going to say, don't you, Chris? And he mm-hmm. stepped on a like a five inch nail, Bruce, right? And it went straight through his foot. He had these boots on. It went straight through his foot, and it came out the other side of his boot. So he's looking at it straight through his foot. Well, exactly. Ouch. So he was doubled over in agony. His work colleagues were like, you know, fainting around him because it was such a gruesome <laughs> sight, you know, this nail shooting through the other side of this bloke's boot. They dialed 999. The ambulance came, took him, took him off to hospital to A&E, writhing in agony. They removed the boot in A&E and they discovered that through sheer fluke, the nail hadn't gone through his foot at all. It had actually gone through the gap in his toes and his foot was completely and utterly unscathed. And yet this guy was doubled up, writhing in agony. That shows that pain is not just a purely physical phenomenon. It's a psychological phenomenon and it's a contextual phenomenon as well. The the pain is like a, am I right? It's like a guesstimate, isn't it? Chris, it's like the brain sees something and says, well, you should be in pain, puts all the pieces together, and sometimes two and two comes up with five, right? So pain, the best way to think about pain is that it's, it's, a, it's an alarm signal for the avoidance of harm. And so uh, often there's a relationship between pain and harm, but often there isn't. So uh, you, you often we go around world, in the world and it hurts, but you haven't really done yourself a tremendous amount of harm. And sometimes you do yourself harm and it doesn't, it doesn't hurt that much. The example that you're talking about there is quite an unusual example, and it's ex- thankfully extremely rare. But what you're getting is that you've got all these visual signals as well. You've got auditory signals. You've got the big five kicking in, and basically they're just t- doing the work. They've taken over the work because it's safer to assume the guesstimates, it's safer to assume that there's major damage than it is to wait and go through all of the program, to go through all of the work of trying to work out whether it has or not. So in that case, which is quite rare in some ways, but a very nice example, you've, you've, uh, where the big five is actually quite useful, they've recruited it to do that work of the pain system. But fundamentally, you're right, pain is, is, a, is a private mental event. It's, it's generated uh, within the central nervous system in the brain. Often it's it's predicted by peripheral damage. Hey, one of my favorite studies in pain you're talking about uh, uh, is a very simple study where somebody somebody basically showed that having two uh, third molar extractions hurts about twice uh, twice as much as having one third molar extraction, right? having your wisdom teeth taken out. Mm. And it's like, well, why is that surprising? Why do I like that study? It's because it's quite a rare study to find that you can double the amount of pain by doubling the damage. <laughs> Because normally it's got very little relationship between peripheral input and damage. And it's got and it's all gated and supported and 
it amplified and diminished by lots of different things along the way. I mean, toothache, uh, let's face it, is, uh, is toothache can be pretty debilitating. You know, that can be really painful and disabling. You can't think about anything else when you've got a really severe, severe, severe toothache, which fortunately I've, has only happened on a few occasions in my life. But when it does happen, it's it's um, it's incredible. So when they when they shove the, the 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 needle in and go, there you go. No more pain. Right. What is that actually doing to the nerve, because it's blocking the nerve at the specific site of pain. Uh, so if you've got a local anaesthetic, that's what you mean, yes, you are blocking that, that, that nervous system. So in, in, in dentistry, though, in some ways, it's relatively simple. But so, yeah, that local anaesthetic is blocked. When you know you're about to do peripheral damage, you're about to cut, or you're about to just, then you can, you know exactly what the cause is likely to be, so you can block that. But yes, so you can block those local nerves. Yeah. It's it's interesting because I mean the the, the case, the, the the case that you know obviously that I've had some experience with not but I'm not because I'm I, I'm not clearly clearly not a lady at least not yet. Um, but the uh, you know you never know. Um, but the you heard it here. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> I'm on the, at the sun right now. Yeah, that's right. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they they, they they already know they're, they're psychic, oh. you know. <laughs> if you want to know the truth, talk to the Daily Mail. Always true, yeah. always all true. <laughs> um, but they, but um, there's a thing called interstitial cystitis yeah. in 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 ladies, um, and it's not cystitis. It has all the symptoms and all the hallmarks of incredible pain, burning sensation, can't can't doubled over in pain, but there's nothing wrong. With them, there's no infection. There's nothing at all wrong, and it's very, very poorly understood. Um, and it's it hap it well. <clears throat> sometimes it happens because of medical procedures that have been done without fully understanding the consequences of them, and as a result, people have been left with damage to the nerves inside the bladder. And here's a curious example of an intervention which, unfortunately, temporarily cured some of these things. There was a procedure whereby the bladder was inflated with hot water under a, under anaesthetic, inflated with hot water to more than its normal, you know, uh, size. And then out you went from hospital. It was a day procedure. And women said, that's it. I'm pain free. That's it. It's done. It's a miracle. And then about a year later, the pain started to come back. And they're going, come on back in, I'll inflate it again. And this time it wasn't quite so successful until they realized what was happening. And what was happening was when they inflated the bladder, they, they broke the connections in some of the uh, sensitive nerves around, there's different nerve fibers inside the bladder. And they broke those connections. Because they broke the connections, the nerves couldn't talk to each other and fire off and give the information, so no more pain. But of course they grow back and they grow back with scar tissue. And now the scar tissue makes life a lot more complicated. Long story short, um, drug um, off-label amyltryptyline, right, which is an antidepressant, but used in kind of microdose, mm -hmm. pain gone, under control, mm -hmm. life restored. So it's, a, it's a, 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 an interesting tale of, of pain control using a using a drug which is you know it's it, at, at low dosage it's, it's astonishing and it, it, it changed my uh my view um on on pain being a like a you know a closeted northerner put up with it because it's 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 natural you know and it'll go away yeah. maybe, maybe there are some interventions that are actually worthwhile and um yeah but why do we have to fight so hard to get those interventions? That's for the, one of the themes of today's interesting conversation. I mean, listen, you, you're born in pain. It's quite likely you're going to die in pain. And most of the significant events of your life, be it accidents, childbirth, etc., will be in the, in the context of pain. Yet somehow we all act, we all collude in the idea that yeah. this is unusual. You it's deserve only happening to you and nobody else. You deserve you it. Should, yeah, you, <laughs> you deserve, deserve it. it. You should pull fault. yourself together. Yeah. 
it's all a bit odd, really, isn't it? Whereas yeah. I'm arguing, maybe there's a fear that if we just all start talking about pain, that we'll all become incredibly unproductive and we'll just sit around all day. In my experience, that's not true. I'll tell you something else. One of the things that fascinates me about subjective private experiences is who the hell gives you the right to question somebody else's pain? No one goes around saying, well, you're not really in grief, are you? Oh, just pull yourself together. <laughs> no, I know your father's died or your wife, but you're not really. I mean, look, you're not even showing the signs of grief. You can't possibly be in grief. But somehow we think it's okay to do that in pain, just to go up to people and say, you're not in pain. <laughs> Bizarre, really. Yeah, well, it, it, I'm sure it terrifies, you know, uh, it, 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 it terrifies uh, uh, medical authorities who, 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 justify their existences by statistics and by <laughs> metrics and things they can measure. Um, and, and measuring a metric of people's uh, subjective pain, incredibly difficult. It is difficult. One of the problems that we have is that we have very few treatments for chronic pain of all sorts. And women tend to fare much worse in all of these metrics and all they have more pain and they do a much worse out of all of the different treatments. But, but we do have some treatments that work, but what we're not very good at is, is identifying who's going to be responding very well to individual treatments and how to switch away very quickly. So if you were to prescribe an intervention for somebody and then it wasn't effective, what you really need to, we know, we know is that it's not going to be effective very quickly. You need to switch out very quickly and to do something else. Well, that's what tends not to happen. People get stuck on ineffective medications or treatments for a long time. We may go on to talk about it, but one of the things that we're interested in is, is getting people to the point very quickly where they know what they have to deal with and then helping people learn to live with persistent pain. Let me just pick up on that about medications then and talk about alternative. And I, I, I'm not trying to you know cover myself in crystals and, and start waving sage smudge sticks and everything else and do it, weird Indian chanting here. Acupuncture, hypnotherapy those kind of interventions for pain, how effective are they? They're difficult to measure for the same reasons it's difficult to measure pain because it's subjective, not objective. But is there is there a scientific basis? Is there an objective basis for any of those as being effective interventions? And, and, and if so, do we know how why they work? And on the back of that, Chris, before, before you answer that, I was, I was in, a few years ago, I was in Dharamsala in northern India, and I was doing a study on um, Buddhist monks up there. And I heard tales of, um, you know, Buddhist, I never saw it with my own eyes, but you hear these tales of Buddhist monks being able to withstand extremely cold temperatures by kind of going into uh, a trance-like state or, or, or stuff like that. So I suppose that's kind of allied to what Bruce was asking as well. I mean, is, is there any, any substance in this at all? Yes, and there are a number of ways of answering that. One is that, that uh, we, need to, we need some humility here. You know, one of the things that we've learned about pain is that we really, we're almost in the dark ages. We, really very, we know very little about, about um, the mechanisms of different uh, chronic pain presentations. Uh, we have some ideas, but, but it's not a very well-mapped system. We don't know what predicts people getting into a state of chronic pain. We don't know why people develop treatment-resistant chronic pain. Um, we have some treatments, but we don't know exactly how they work. We're going to look back on this period with, with some sense of horror at this sort of barbarism that we're practicing in some ways. Um, that doesn't mean that we should turn away and not try to offer things, mm. but I think some humility is necessary. Secondly, and so when I, when I look at that, if, if somebody comes to me and says, this standing on my head really worked, I say, great, who am I to say? I, I don't know what the mechanism is and what it isn't, et cetera, as long as it's not doing any harm, that's fine. Um, so that's, I need to park that and just say, listen, sure. we just need a little bit of humility. Um, if you're looking at the evidence base, though, it's not the reason that it's hard to establish treatments um, like wh whether they're effective or not, and most of the evidence the sort of formal evidence for acupuncture is, is not very positive uh, is because of the way in which we do trials and the way in which we study things. It's very hard, first of all, to find people who deliver these things who aren't strongly of the belief that they work. In other words, they don't have equipoise. So you're sort of screwed before you start because 
you need somebody who really doesn't doesn't is doesn't know either way whether it works or not. Secondly, it's very different to to blind these things, so to to work out whether you did get them or not. In other words, so it's just very difficult to do. So what you'll find if you go to the literature is an awful lot of relatively poorly controlled studies that are very positive. Just for our listeners, uh, um, Chris, so it's important that you, yeah. you don't have that prior belief that it works because, of course, unconsciously as an, as an yeah. experimenter, you can you can kind of bias the results, can't you, without even exactly. meaning to do so. And that, that's exactly right. And that's true yeah. in psychology. It's true in, in uh, pharmacology. It's true in whatever. But you need to have that non-belief. But there's a tricky thing, though, isn't it? Because how these things develop is because you get inventors and you get creators. And the only reason that they're able to be successful is they truly believe in something. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's how do you yeah. get from A to B? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I am just very pragmatic about these things. Uh, those of you who are interested, there is a something called the Cochrane uh, Library, which um, we have reviewed all the evidence in these different treatments and they're freely available if people want to look at them. But I'll give you a warning. What you're likely to find is the conclusion that that we don't know enough, and we need to do, we need to know more. <laughs> that, that's probably that's probably a good conclusion for most for most things, actually, yeah. isn't it? Really? Yeah, I know it's very frustrating, though, isn't it? Yeah. You find something that looks really interesting and it says we don't know. Bruce yeah. was talking a bit yeah. earlier there, Chris, about you know women and um, yeah. and and the cystitis, uh, pain of the cystitis, and a more general question which I'm really interested in is whether there are individual differences in pain threshold so you often you know it's really funny you know you you, you hear you know the women talking about childbirth and they say well you know men never really know what real pain is because they've never experienced the pain of childbirth and you know whenever I hear that I think to myself well how many of you have ever caught yourselves in a zipper that's what I'm secretly thinking when I hear that kind of conversation. But I'm are, you, are you are you sleeping outside tonight, then, Kevin? Uh, well, no. <laughs> I've, been, I've been sleeping outside for a long time. Yeah. But um, you know, it, you you hear this anecdotally, don't you, Chris? That you know, women have a higher top pain threshold than men, and it. Is there any truth in it? Are there are there individual different? I mean, we some you hear also, you know. Well, some people have got, you know, he's got a high pain threshold or whatever, whatever. I mean, what what does that mean? Is there any is there any kind of truth in that? So I hesitate for a conversation of three blokes to talk about women's. Experience. I was going to say, there's <laughs> three blokes talking about childbirth. Uh, hang on a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. But that said, uh, the, the evidence is is definitely in the right way because. Um, Unfortunately, there are just no two ways around it. Women experience more pain than men on virtually every uh, yeah. situation that you can think of that's relevant. Um, they're much more uh, men have have lower pain thresholds are much more likely to report pain. Interesting. So women ah. endure more pain, experience more pain, and have lower thresholds. So I think they're, they're fairly stable differences. So they're overrepresented in every population of chronic pain sufferer that you get where it's possible to have both. Um, but in, ex in laboratory experiments, they're much more likely to report um, to, to, to report pain less quickly than you or I would. Interesting about pain then with childbirth in particular, because obviously that's a very, I mean, that's a, an extreme event mm -hmm. uh, in, in somebody's life, in, in, in a lady's life, which we cannot uh, comprehend. I don't think there's nothing, there's nothing in our, makeup that and there's nothing we would experience there you know probably no. I, I suppose and, having a limb sawn off without anesthetic might come close but it and is, i notice nobody's queuing up to, to have the experience yeah, yeah 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 so so but but now and, and given that there are all shades of women there are women who go there's no way i'm experiencing any pain whatsoever give me the epidural uh, i'll have the cesarean wake me up when it's over but I mean, for example, all my three kids, I mean, I was born upstairs in a bedroom um, in, in workshop, right? Um, so the doctor turned around, but turned up and all of a sudden, whoosh, that was it. And then he, he was gone and that was end of, end of story. Um, uh, my three kids were all born at home, but for pain relief, she said, well, I, I don't want to have an epidural or anything else like that. So we actually found an, uh, um, uh, an obstetrician or a gynecologist uh, obstetrician um, who did uh, hypnotherapy for pain relief. Yeah. And it was self-hypnosis. So, um, 
I was okay. Let's let's go on then. You know. So I I turned up and she went. Well, seeing as you're here and you're the dad, would you like to uh, sit on the bean bag and and do the self hypnosis thing yourself? I went. Yeah. Okay. Go on then. So. 20 minutes later, I thought I'd had the best like four hours sleep I'd had. What I was, I was like, that was amazing. Yeah. Wow. How does that work? And I actually used it. I mean, I, we, we sort of tried it during the, the birth and uh, it was, if I think it was effective up to a point. Um, yeah. and, and, and then, and then it was, it was got all got a bit extreme, but I actually used it. I mean, I, I, I used to use it on stage. Yeah, you know, I used to use it on stage when I was absolutely knackered and I was all tense and uh, my throat was, uh, and I'd, I, in the middle of a show, five minutes, I'd sort of like stick my head down into a little facial steamer and go, what are the words I have to say? I'm da 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 da, and I'd try and float myself down through the little visualization thing, and then I'd float myself back up again and give myself a top up, and That's and, object, and and I'm thinking, hey, it works, amazing. Yeah, I never. That's fantastic. I never knew you were such a modern man. I'm not. I'm Cro-Magnon, <laughs> mate. Cro-Magnon. But they, they were more modern than we are, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but let, let's let's explore that because I think it's absolutely fascinating. I think why are we surprised? Uh, the body has the the mind has the capacity to overcome the body. I interviewed somebody who was who was good at at, a, at, at extremely controlling each of their senses. So some like a free diver who can go past the the the, the demand and the desire to breathe uh, for sport. Um, distance uh, runners who were able to overcome the fatigue and that, sh that uh, voice in their head saying stop. You know, I, uh, people are interviewing all these different people who are able, able to do this. So what that tells me is the body has the ability in extreme circumstances. So you're, you've got three levels of defense. The first is to keep yourself regulated. The second is to listen to your body when it says stop or scratch or run away or whatever it is. And the third, when you have no way of escaping at all, is to overcome that level of, and um, we've got lots and lots of examples of where you can you can go past it. And actually, most of the time, your mind tells you, for example, to breathe long before you become deoxygenated and you need to breathe. Uh, that you get the you get something that says itch. You know, now you need to scratch long before there's anything in, that's any danger. So those you you the fatigue comes in a lot earlier than it needs to. So you can overcome it and go past it. The danger, of course, is what you just said, is what happens next. There's no second warning, right? There's no, you don't get a second chance. So then you have to decide when to come back. So you have the ability to do that. And hypnosis is, is definitely coming back into fashion and it's becoming more acceptable. It's being seen less, less uh, uh, extreme in many ways. People are, there's a, there's a company in, in Belgium, for example, are running trials in virtual reality hypnosis as an alternative to anesthesia because, so, because you can actually put people in that deep state of immersion and you're not, a, you don't necessarily, you can separate yourself from your body and you won't be able to, to experience the same things. What you said is very important at the end though. These things don't last for a long time. It's not, a, it's not something you want to do for a long time. It will kick back in. So we're hoping you are enjoying our little chat on Psycho Schizo Espresso. But don't forget, we do have a special thing for you. If you want to pay £4 a month, you can become a Patreon, which means you get the unedited content, you get the extra long episodes, and we're even going to come up with some special stuff for you. Uh, you can become a Patreon if you want at www.patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, Dot com forward slash psycho schizo espresso and now back to the music chris i i this is something that bruce and i are both very interested in i know bruce is uh, is keen to to explore this so um you know we have adrenaline junkies you know people mm. that you know jump off of tall buildings base jumping all that kind of thing uh, yeah. Drive fast, all that kind of stuff. The adrenaline junkie. Um, is there such a thing as a pain junkie? And I'm kind of thinking here. We, we, you know, we, we're veering into kind of the the subject of masochism now, and that kind of thing. I mean, is there is there such a thing as a pain junkie? 
Um, in the same way that there might be people that pursue danger for thrills. Is, is it the same with pain? That's a great question. So masochism is often misunderstood. What masochism is about is less about pain and more about punishment. So what, I remember the word pain comes from the Latin poena, which means punishment. So the two things are very closely related to each other. Mm. And often what's happening in masochism is that people are interested. It's, not, it's less about the pain and more about, more about uh, giving up control of your body to somebody else mm. and the idea that you can be physically uh, embodied, as it were. So it's, just, so, so it's, it's about suspending agency in some way. Um, so um, let's take that in a different way. So let's take that principle. We will, and and uh, this, this goes, how far back do you want to go? This goes back to sort of Western civilization and the way we think about our cultures. Think about an Old Testament God, right? Remember your Old Testament God. An Old Testament God was abstractly punishing. Right? It would just, would flood, would send, uh, would send disease. Mm. I mean, if you read the Old Testament, it's horrible, horrible ways of doing things, but, the, but they would never be embodied. The mm. New Testament God, this is the way in which we, we lived our lives in Western civilization, is embodied and being punished themselves, right? being crucified. Mm. And, then, and then you get to, to observe and feel, uh, and, and feel guilty about that. The reason that's important is because that shift Mm. towards uh, what we, the way we now live our modern life is that we're full, we are full of self-regard and, uh, and sort of relentless uh, self-examination. Um, this is my theory as, as in modern civilization. So mm. if you spend all your time in your head thinking about who you are, then the question that becomes a, that you're constantly having this gnawing punishing relentless self-regard and where pain comes into that is that suddenly it's been commercialized and offered as a potential release so pain junkies there are lots of pain junkies right so rebecca scott who's a, a management researcher at cardiff university did ask this wonderful question she said well, why is it that all these people are trying to create analgesics and ways to help you in pain meanwhile there are all these other people seeking it out right yeah. the, <laughs> they're, they're wanting to be electrocuted and crawl under things. They're wanting to do all these things. What's going on? What's going on with these people? Why is it that they, why do people want to pay for an experience marketed as painful is what she asked. And I guess what she found great is two very, two very, it's a great question, yeah. isn't it? What she found is two, uh, two simple answers. One is that we've been talking about a lot is that people are living in their heads and they want to get back in touch with the physical being of having a body to be, to not being able to think about anything else except this physical physicality that you have and to, to have some distraction from that relentless modern self. But that's a, spe that's a spectrum which covers and, extreme and, and, sports yeah. as well, doesn't it? So your extreme sports on the one yeah, hand, yeah, the masochistic exactly, yeah. pain delivery, that's, right. that's yeah. a spectrum. Yeah. It's like your psychopathy yeah, exactly. spectrum. It's a spectrum. The same thing. Yeah, go on. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And that other side is exactly that, is that it's a temporary relief. So all of those people from, from, from self-awareness, from the burdens of self-awareness. So I think it's a great piece of work. It's a really smart question. She's a really smart researcher. Yeah. And it's a great thing to think about. Why is it that, in, let's not fool ourselves that we're just desperately trying to get rid of pain. Some people are trying to embrace pain as a way just to feel alive. Chris, we were talking uh, about the guy that had the nail through his foot. Uh, yeah. or thought he had the nail through his foot and experienced extreme excruciating agony. And then when he went to any, he got it removed and actually gone between his toes. Is the opposite true? Is it, is it possible that we can do actually rather severe damage to ourselves, but, um, you know, severe tissue damage, but actually because we don't realise we've done it or because it doesn't look that severe, we don't actually experience the accompanying pain? Does it work the other way then? Yeah, quite often, I think. Yeah, people can push through too hard. And um, yeah, absolutely it can. And that, that's something that we need to sometimes pay attention to at a broader level. There are people who, who are, I mean, we're so used to talking about people who complain too much, but actually a bigger problem often is people don't complain enough. Um, it's, a, it's a problem in, in men's uh, health in particular, as people who don't report things, people who think it's just normal. The number of people who are living with, uh, we are talking about endometriosis earlier on, the number of people who are living with painful um, endometriosis or even just painful menstruation 
uh, is astonishing, the number of women who don't, they just think they're supposed to get on with pain and this is just normal and it's okay. Um, so I think that that that's, that's sort of over-cultural denial of something and ignoring things that shouldn't be ignored and just pushing on also happens. And it can happen at a at a sort of individual or a biological level as well, where you don't notice, you know, you're, you're in, over engaged in something and you don't notice what's happening. Yeah. So if you're in chronic pain, Chris, and, and I know that you study and, and try to help people in chronic pain, mm. um, is there, we were talking about identity earlier on. I mean, do you find that there are, that chronic pain does have an effect on sufferer's identity i'm just thinking in terms of like if you suddenly you know you're active um and um you know you suddenly find yourself in uh, with a kind of pain that prevents you from you know doing what you used to do um i guess the question i'm asking is does that have an effect on you know obviously it has an effect on the person's outlook on life but does it actually affect their identity in a sense that they somehow perceive that actually they're not the person that they were before with this pain is that something that you deal with or yeah that's a that's a great question because do you know that that's very smart kevin because if um it's what we both we've all been talking about today is this idea of identity yes yeah, cropped up right? time and time again hasn't yeah. it yeah but if you were to visit from another planet and you'd read a psychology textbook in pain you'd think the pain was all about depression anxiety mm. uh, anger or relationships etc these things that um that, that, that get studied a lot but if you were to talk to somebody in pain they would talk about what we call social emotions they talk about guilt and shame mm. and embarrassment and they'd say their relationships aren't the way they want them to be they're not the person they want them to be mm. now, the first patients i ever met wanted to swim around the Ark Royal, which was an old British battle cruiser, yeah. which is quite large. But then I, I remember looking at him thinking, but you're in a wheelchair and he said, uh, and you haven't swum for a metre in over five years. But his identity was as a fit young man who could do these things. And to him, anything other than getting back to that was intolerable. At the other extreme, I've met people who are saying, but I really need to get back to work. That because my identity is a being at work, but then you say, Yes, but if you hadn't have had pain, you would have retired five years ago. He said, Oh, I never thought of it that way. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you sort of get suspended. What chronic pain does, I think, um, and by chronic we mean long standing, mm -hmm. is that it, um, it, it often suspends people at a, in a particular age. And ah. they, they're thinking, Well, I want to get back to where I was, it stops you from developing. And then other people report feeling just two are older before their time, not who they want to be. So I actually think that is exactly what we're saying here is the great new frontier of psychological pain research is actually helping people understand their identity changes and shifts and what's possible with pain. It's not necessarily, of course, being less depressed and being more active and not being anxious and fearful are really very important and they're part of that. But the overarching question is of a modern age is, is who am I and can I can I adapt to having pain or should I be fighting back and changing things or how am I going to live now as this person with pain? Yeah, the the I heard once, Chris, that um, and I have to ask you about this. I heard someone say that actually you were talking there about emotional pain and the pain of rejection and that kind of thing yeah. and. I heard someone say once that actually, you know, emotional pain and the pain of rejection actually activates exactly the same parts of the brain as physical pain. And the two are extremely linked. Is that true or is it, is it, uh, was that just, um, was that just hearsay? It's not hearsay. There's a, there's a guy called uh, Brock Hastian in, in, in uh, Australia who's really trying to push this idea of what was what's called social pain. And if yeah. you'd asked me, if you'd asked me 10, 15 years ago, I would have said pa or something similar. I think it's just a, it's just being borrowed. People use the word pain to mean all sorts of things. Um, they, you know, I mean, pain can mean anything from grief to um, minor rejection because, uh, because somebody didn't laugh at my joke. Unbelievable though that might be. You know, it could mean anything. Um, and so people are just using it linguistically. And I would have said that. But actually, there is some evidence to show that really? so that high levels of social rejection and um, and grief, for example, if you ever had grief, uh, then then some people who have severe grief can feel like 
not just metaphorically being kicked in the stomach. You know, it can, the suffering is is very close. There was this study which looked at violinists and they found that actually the violinists, these are uh, virtuoso violinists, and the pain threshold in, in virtuoso violinists playing hands um, was actually less than it was in their non-playing hands because obviously pain in their playing hands would be a big deal. It might mean that they might not be able to play for a while. Interesting. Whereas in the other hand, in the non-playing hand, um, it wouldn't be such a big deal. So it kind of gets at that idea of it's not just tissue damage or potential tissue yeah. damage. It's also the idea of, you know, the context and, and the, the psychological. But one of the things I'm really interested in is to understand the, the specificity of context. So so people often think, oh, I won't talk about function. I want to get back to work and I want to do this. I always remember a patient who said to me, I said, well, what would, what would good look like to you? And she said, well, when my grandchildren run towards me, I want to be able to open my arms and welcome them rather than pulling my arms in because I'm scared they're going to hurt me as they jump on me. Oh to her, that was priceless, right? Yeah. That was what she yeah. wanted to do in life. Somebody else talking about identity said to me, well, I just want to be able to wash my hair by myself and not rely on somebody else to do it. Mm. Sometimes it's the small things, but we've been talking about context and, and, and specifics. Um, there are so many of these areas where, especially in high performance athletes and musicians that you mentioned, Kevin, where we know so little, there are very few mm. studies. I tried to do some work with, in ballet a few years ago and with, with uh, pianists, for example, who are quite interesting. Mm. And it's a bit like high performance sport in that people mm. don't want to talk about it and there's too much fear around it and there's a there's a terror or that it might go wrong. I wonder, Bruce, how it was in your musical career. Was there any talk about pain at all? No, not at all. I mean, I mean, we, I mean, and, and we, we sort of. I mean, we've got, uh, we've got a, a, a year-long membership of the Neurofen subscription club. Um, you know, <laughs> a bit, a bit before shows now. You know, we're all in our sixties, and everybody's got, everybody's got injuries. You know, knee injuries, head injuries in some cases. I mean. You know, uh, um, you know, Yannick took a flyer off the stage. I actually thought he was dead because it was a, he, he fell straight. He fell head first into an iron bar, uh, uh, a four foot drop, and then another four foot drop. He was knocked unconscious during the show, head wound. So it it, it looked horrendous, you know, and um, his body was black and blue afterwards from the bruising. And it took him a good time to recover from that and a good time mentally to recover from that as well, you know, because it really knocks your confidence. I mean, our drummer, you know, Nick has some problems with arthritis in one of his hands, uh, which he, he, he copes with, with some drugs and with ice and all these other things. But you, you just have coping strategies. I'm a, I mean, our bass player has got terrible low back problems um from leaping around with a big heavy bass because he's not a big lad and so the bass is nearly as tall as he is and and you know so he's hit you in the face a few times with it as well bruce isn't he on stage yeah i got i got bits, I got bits of my teeth missing as a result yeah you know but but again you deal with pain i mean i i herniated a disc in my neck um head banging my own fault you know but um, I lost the use of my left arm on, when I was 20, some, almost lost the use of my left arm, you know, and, and I was on tour. So I just dealt with it because um, there was nothing. So what's the, what's the culture, Bruce? What's the culture? Is this seen as a badge of honour or is it... No, it's a pain or, in the... It's let's a, not talk about it. No, it's a pain in the arse. But, but, but the trouble is, is that, that other people can only give you so much backup. Is the, for me, that's the truth of it. So, mm. so, so when I sort of go, oh, my arm hurts, what do I want? All, all the other guys to go, oh, your arm hurts. And that makes me feel mm. better. No, it makes me feel like, a, like a, well, really, you know. Now, a bit of concern, yeah. yeah. But at the same time, I don't want to be going around sort of going, having a big flag going, my arm hurts, like every five minutes. But I make a point if... Um, if we're in rehearsals, and I know you know Nick's had a bit of a problem, you know, with his with his thumb or something, you know, I come in in the morning and we sort of like, uh, you know, as as the wrist today, you know, and he's going, oh, it's all right, mate, no, no worries, you know, bang, bang, you know, and you 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 do sort of try, you, you, you've got to do it, you know, you can't you can't not do it. Yeah. That's the point, and and so you just have to mentally do the best yeah. you can. When I bust my Achilles. 
um, four months later, after breaking my Achilles and having it stitched back together, I was on tour in front of 20,000 people wearing a 35 kilo flamethrower going up and downstairs, having a sword fight with a giant 10 foot monster. And I couldn't walk <laughs> and I couldn't run. So I learned to walk using my quads and not using my calves. That way I could like walk like a crab, but it, it looked kind of athletic and it was, but not in the way that it's, 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 it's not as you know, not as we know it, Jim, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't athleticism as we, it was because I couldn't, yeah. wouldn't walk and run. So I developed this way of moving. No, and nobody twigged so you it. made it happen. Nobody yeah. twigged it. We made it happen. And at the end of every show, I was in, <laughs> well, for some of them anyway, I was in absolute agony. I mean, I walked off and I was hobbling yeah. like that. And my manager went, he said, oh, that was really good. You're all right. I went, no, I'm fucking not all right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I just went away. <laughs> you know, yeah. but you just do. That's it's, you. 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 You get on with it, and then you sort of go well. You make it work. I've, you make it work. You make it work. It's not a desirable situation. Isn't, isn't that? Uh, isn't that interesting? Not just the ten foot monster, but isn't that interesting? Because I was one of the things that fascinated us is I want to time it one day. Is is how much when sympathy turns into irritation in other people, right? Yeah. It's not a personal problem I've got, but it's like, I reckon you could time it because I reckon it's incredibly short. We've been talking about this a lot today, which is, uh, you know, why, why don't people pay more attention to pain? Because it's so important and it's everywhere. But actually, we're quite intolerant of listening to each other's pain. Uh, and I think the reason for that is because we want to make it better. And if we can't, there's this wonderful mismatch. People are generally, I want to believe, very helpful. So if you say to me, I'm in pain, I want to I want to help you. But if you keep telling me you're in pain, then you're just basically telling me that I'm useless because I haven't got any way to help you. So I don't want to hear it anymore. But you, remember, if you're in pain, you've got this tell somebody, tell somebody, tell somebody, tell somebody thing going on because it's, gonna, it's in harm, harm, harm. Yeah. So you're driven to keep talking about it and everyone else is driven to not listen to it. Yeah. Boom. That's, yeah. that's yeah. the problem we've got. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and there is a difference between the way women deal with that and men deal with that on man to man, woman to woman, man to woman. There's a difference between the sexes quantifiably there. Yeah. But I have to ask you before you go uh, to round things off, what can we do about it? Are there any simple tips that you can give us that you know next time we find ourselves in pain here's what we should do i mean you said you started off your you know scientific life looking at distraction um and that's something you often hear well you know distraction works or what, what, what have you i mean does it work and if it doesn't what else can we do what can we do to help ourselves deal with pain so distraction can work, but it's effortful, right? So if it's, if it's necessary and then you can do it, then that's great. But you're not going to be able to do it for very long. So pain is a, is about uh, is about pr uh, the avoidance of harm. So the first thing you can do when you're in pain is to try and work out really as quickly as you possibly can whether that signal is 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 reliable or not. You know, is there harm? Have you done something? Right? Do you know? Do you remember that thing where where everybody gets? Where, where it really hurts until you work out what caused it and then and then it goes away. Mm. So that's about, you really need to work out quickly, is this harm or not harm? And if it is harm, then you need to sort something out, normally by getting away from that harm, so moving your hand away from a hot plate or whatever it might be. But if it isn't, if it's something you're going through because you want to adorn your body in some way or or it's, it's just something that's come on, you understand and it's going to take time to get better, then really understand, trying to work out how long it's going to last for, what the limits are, what you can invest in uh, to do something different, whether distracting yourself or not. And if possible, and you've got access and it's helpful using an analgesic. You know, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not suggesting try mind over matter if the yeah. ibuprofen is going to help. Right? Yeah. But I think the trick is, is always pain is, is here, pain is part of your life. It's always going to be part of everybody's everyday life. The question is not really the pain. The question is, how reliable is that signal? And what, what is it telling me that I need to do? If, if you've got someone in chronic pain, Chris, and, and you, you deal with them, uh, yeah. uh, chronic pain patients, I mean, does it help to sometimes say, if, you know, well, you, I suppose there's a fine line between saying to someone, well, you've just got to live with this. 
um, you know, this the pain's going to be there, and you have to you have to deal with it. I suppose, I suppose, on one way, you're being honest with someone by saying that, but but on the other hand, they may see that as well, you know, slightly disrespectful. I suppose, in a way, I'm not sure. Does it does it help if you if you've got someone for who, who's in chronic pain? Did, does it help them to for you to say, well, you you've got to accept this pain as it is, rather than you know, try to constantly, I don't know, seek ways of getting around it or getting rid of it. Yeah, I, I often think it doesn't help. We've done a lot of work on, on this idea of acceptance. And I think often people, when it's a sort of relatively technical phrase within psychology, but what, it, what most people hear when you say acceptance is that somehow that they're weak, that it's unimportant, that they need to just get on with things that they shouldn't be feeling yeah. the way that they're feeling. And so there's no shorter way of, of, of pissing somebody off and getting them angry by saying this is something you need to learn to live yeah. with. The thing to remember is that people, even the people who are absolutely superb at living with pain will never give up the hope that it might be going away. Mm. And that's because it's an evolutionary hardwired system to basically prom- tell you that, you're, that there's damage going on and you need to attend towards it. So I think what what we need to do is to is to help people reach a space with what they can live with and what they can't live with, what they need to actually, what needs to happen to exhaust them or convince them that something hasn't been missed or something's going on. When you make the judgment of, well, well, it might be possible to find something, but will that actually take the pain away? I think what we're trying to do is walk with somebody, mm. not tell them to walk away from you. Yeah. You actually try and say, come with me, and then we can explore what's going on. Often in chronic pain management, it's a bit of a misnomer, really, because you're not managing the pain. What you're managing is helping somebody to get back to the life that they've lost, managing the depression and the misery and the relationship problems and the getting back to work and the activity and the identity mm-hmm. challenge. That we can do something about, even if we can't take the pain away. Honestly, Chris, when you said earlier that, you know, we're almost in the dark ages here, you know, we're just starting off and we're going to look back and we need humility and we're going to look back in in a number of years time and at this period and wonder what the hell we were doing. I think, um, yeah, I think uh, on the one level, I think that's very, very exciting going forward and it's, it's all to play for, really. It is. Hello, folks. We hope you're enjoying Psycho Schizo Espresso. Just to remind you, it's a pod prod production. So please feel free to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcast. Uh, you can also reach out to us on email at psc at podprod.co.uk and follow us on social media on the hashtag Psycho Schizo Espresso. You can also of course become a patreon by clicking on www.patreon.com forward slash psycho espresso where you can gain exclusive access to unedited and unfiltered content if your brain can possibly handle any more of me and bruce